My name is Christian. I'm the senior pastor here at Expectation Church. Uh, if it's your first time joining us this morning, then um, I'm not, it's not just pie in the sky. I'm actually saying this. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, one of our core values here at this church is welcome home. And that doesn't mean we want this place to feel like, you know, a, a cup of hot chocolate sitting by the fire, kind of welcome home. It's welcome home as in like, I'm, I'm, we want to celebrate your, your homecoming. We're glad that you are here. Um, so with all, that, with all that just said, if it's your first time here and you haven't, um, I know Mike, the, the worship leader that was up here, um, I act like I don't know the guy. <laughs> I've known the guy for like 15 years. But anyway, um, he, he talked about filling up that red card. Um, at any point in, in today's sermon or message, if you have a, a question or um, if you just want to like introduce yourself to me, that red card would be a great first step to do that. Just fill that out and you can take it to the red tent afterwards. I'd love to get the opportunity to, to meet you. Generally speaking, I, I follow up on all of those cards that get turned in because I like to um, get that, that time. So I'll, I'll call you later this evening or, um, you can, uh, or I'll send you an email. I'm actually not a phone call guy. I say that. Didn't you just say you would call people? I do. And I, cause some people prefer the phone. And so I like to meet people where they're at and be able to talk to them. But I'm like an, I'm an email guy through and through. Anybody else like that? No? Okay, cool. Um, I, like, I like the email because it gives me a time to actually like think and so, so I don't say stupid stuff. Um, because I do that a lot. I know <laughs> you're in the wrong profession there, big guy. Well, we'll just let the Holy Spirit do the talking. That's the prayer and move me out of the way. Um, so I would love to, to get the chance to uh, welcome you home personally and, and get to know your name. I'm, I'm still, I'm terrible, terrible, terrible with names. Um, we have a, a, um, a couple in our church that's been with our church for a number of years and um, during one of the meetings uh, that we have, we have a, 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 an annual business meeting once a year where people vote and they have to like, we follow Robert's rules of orders and she raised her hand to second emotion and I said, and you second the motion and she goes, Lisa, I'm like, I know it's your name. I just forget everything all the time, so I'm sorry. So keep introducing yourself to me. That red card's a great way to do it. So let's just make that as a rule from now on. Anytime you come up and talk to me, say your first name first. So like last, last service I talked about, it, there's this um, beautiful woman in our church named Stephanie. And every time she comes up and talks to me, I want her to say, hi, my name is Stephanie. I know I could say she's beautiful because she's my wife. I've been married to her for 15 years. So just keep, keep introducing yourself. So that way I'll, I'll get your name down. And um, I'd love to get the chance to meet you. I'd love to get the chance to know you. Um, especially, uh, talking about, the reason I'm talking so much about that red card is today there might be an action step for you after we talk about what we're going to talk about today. And that red card would be a great way for you to take that next action step. Um, what we've been doing at our church, what we started last week, and we're going to continue to talk about next week, and it'll culminate, it'll finish next week, is we've been talking about baptism. And the title of this little series is called And Be Baptized, and you'll see why, where that comes from in Scripture. But what we did last week is I preached this message called Simple Baptism, just looking at what baptism actually is, what baptism scripturally is, about how baptism is, is identity and baptism is unity and, 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 and baptism is the gospel. It's looking at um, what the Bible says about baptism. We talked about history. We had a, hopefully we had a good time. Next week, what we're going to do is we're actually going to, um, I'm not going to preach very much. We are going to put a baptismal pool I've been told right about here, it might change between now and then because I, I don't make these decisions. Um, delegate, they call that good leadership, right? When you delegate. Um, so we're gonna put the pool, I've been told right about here, and we're gonna bring people out on stage to get baptized. And it's not gonna be me that's doing the preaching. It's gonna be the baptisms that are doing the preaching. The baptisms are going to proclaim new life in Christ and how life can be found as, as we bear witness to people getting baptized in our church. So it should be a really cool Sunday. I'm looking forward to it. I have had a few warnings um, about this because when, when, when you dunk some people in water, apparently water splashes. And I, I've got my, my tech team. We have these things. You can't see them from where you're at, but like in the floor, there's these little floor pods, see? And underneath is, is a bunch of electronics and stuff. And they keep reiterating to me that water and electronics don't mix. So they're like, okay, we could do this, but there has to be like a tarp and some towels and like waterproof everything because they're nervous about me ruining all the equipment up here. Eh. And it's going to be worth it because people are going to get baptized. So I'm really excited about it. So yeah, you, yeah, we can bring that up. I love it. We elevated in here. 
So I am, I am excited about next week. I'm excited about getting to baptize and, and, and being a part of that. I'm not doing all of the baptisms. There's going to be parents baptizing their kids who have made a profession of faith, and there's going to be uh, other pastors and other people baptizing. So I'm really excited about it next week. But today, what I want to get into, last week we talked about simple baptism. Today I want to talk about the simple why. Why should people be baptized. And last week I talked about, I, I, I talked about it quite a bit actually, infant baptism because I was sprinkled as a baby um, and, and, and we didn't get real into the, the, the theology and the doctrine of, it's called pedo-baptism or pedo-baptism and what it means is, is to, to sprinkle babies and it's a, some people call it covenantal baptism. We didn't get real deep into that. I kind of mentioned it and talked about some other history things, but Today, I kind of want to push all of that aside and, and just very simply look at the reason why people should be baptized. So the first passage of scripture, I've got three passages that I'm going to talk out of. The first one comes from Matthew chapter 3, um, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, that's a river, to be baptized by John. Okay. Now, if you are, have read the Bible before, um, you, you may have read this passage before and you just keep going. You pass right through verse 13. Uh, or maybe you've never read the Bible before and you're, you're in this room or you're watching online right now and you're with us and you've never read the Bible, great. Um, watch the screen and, 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 and if, you, if you have a Bible, open it up. And if you need a Bible, send me an email. I will put a, a I will, we, have, we buy these things by the case and the reason I preach out of the NIV so much is this is the Bible that we give away to people, so I try to create consistency for people. Um, but we, I'll give you a Bible if you need one. We buy them by the case to give away. I think Bibles are supposed to be given away. So if this is new to you, get a Bible. And even if you don't want me to give you a Bible because you're like contact-free on everything, that's okay. You can pull out your phone, which is, I promise, your phone is like the most sterile instrument in your house. You can pull out your phone. You can go to the Bible app. It's an excellent app made by Uversion, which there's a bunch of them out there. Uversion's my favorite. Um, but you can pull it up, and I want you to, to read Matthew 3.13, but you can't go so quickly through it. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Where Jesus was in Galilee, a city called Nazareth, for him to go to the Jordan where John was, that was 70 miles. 70 miles. And they weren't cruising on cruise control with a vehicle. Cruise control may have been a donkey or a camel. And Jesus, we know from when we read the story of his life, he was, he was poor. So he was on foot. So he hoofed it for 70 miles. And the Bible tells us very clearly, he came from Galilee to the Jordan. Why? To be baptized by John. He had a purpose in his mind that drove him to walk 70 miles. 70 miles to get baptized by John. Now this John right here, um, when, you, when you read the, the Gospels, the Gospels are the stories of Jesus. So Matthew, the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, Luke, and John. That John, the John that I just mentioned, that's one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the followers of Jesus. This John right here is a different John. It's John the Baptist. And you might be saying, well, see, the Bible's just confusing. Come on. You don't know more than one person named John? I know you do. Come on now. So John the Baptist and John the disciple are two different people. And John the Baptist is, is the subject, is the person, is the character in this story. He was actually Jesus' cousin. They knew each other. And John tried to deter him, tried to, to deter Jesus, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? So if you, if you go back, the, the, the verses leading up to verse 13, what happened is John, he comes on the scene, and he's in, in, the, in this desert region in the, by the Jordan River, and he starts baptizing, he starts preaching, he starts telling people, hey, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is almost here. You guys need to be ready for this. You need to be ready for what God wants to do. So repent. Stop doing the wrong thing. Stop going away from God. Turn around and start doing what God wants for your life. Be ready for him. So it was a baptism of repentance. He said, because someone's coming after me. I'm here to dunk you in water. But there's a guy coming after me that is so much better than me. 
I can't even, I'm not even worth uh, uh, untying his shoes. He's so much better than me. And he's going to baptize you not with water, but with fire and with the Holy Spirit. His baptism is much greater than mine. So John's been preaching this message. And so Jesus walks these 70 miles to John the Baptist to be baptized in water by him. And so obviously John's like, whoa, guy, okay, you need to baptize me. I've been telling everybody that someone greater than me is coming with a greater baptism. Why are you coming to me to be baptized in water? I think you should baptize me, Jesus. Verse 15 is very, very important. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So John and Jesus went down into the water and John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the greater one, the one with the greater baptism. And this is important. Verse 15 can't be skipped over. And I think there's some things that, are, that, that, that draw our attention to this. I'm not, when, so I, I started this message by saying that the, the title is the simple why. Why should we get baptized? I'm not telling you that we should get baptized because Jesus got baptized. In fact, I don't even think that is the important part of this passage. What are you talking about, Christian? This passage is all about baptism. Of course, that's the, the most important part. I don't think so. Because look at what Jesus said to John the Baptist. He said, let it be so now it is proper for us. I think this was a specific situation. This is not a global rule for all people. Jesus is saying, John, right now, in this time, this is the right thing for us, you and me, to do. Because he goes on to say, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. That word fulfill, every time Matthew, the guy that wrote this, every time Matthew uses that word fulfill, he's talking about uh, uh, the, the, the commands of God or the prophecies of God being fulfilled. What God says coming to being. And every time he uses this word righteousness, he's talking about that which God calls right. That which God wants his people to do. So when Jesus said, this is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness, I think what Jesus was saying is, John, right now, in this moment, between you and me, this is what God wants us to do. I walked 70 miles to do what God wants us to do. So even though John was Jesus' subordinate, even though Jesus was far superior with a far superior baptism, this is what God wanted for John and Jesus. And so John consented. After Jesus gets baptized by John. Look at what happens next. We go to verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and alighting on him and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It's this big declarative statement by God and it's actually kind of ironic that this phrase right here, this is my son. After Jesus was baptized by John, he goes into the wilderness, goes into the desert by himself for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days. No food or water for 40 days. I've actually done that myself. I, the, not, the, not the no food or water part, the no food part. Um, it's rough. It, I, it's one of these things where you might, I've actually done it a, a few times, and I'm not saying that to, to brag or to toot my own horn. It is a very extremely uh, humbling experience. Um, it it, it, it kind of wrecked me, and it, it's not... I, it, it. So I don't think every Christian should fast for 40 days. You should only fast for 40 days if that's what God wants you to do. And even then, you should probably talk to your doctor first because weird things start happening to your mind and body. Um, you get really stupid. It's just true because <laughs> you're deprived of calories. Your brain doesn't work as well. And you get really hangry. You know what hangry is? Hangry is when you take hungry and angry and you put them together. That's hangry. So you're like a mean idiot for a month. I think Jesus was probably better than that. But Jesus goes into the wilderness 
and he fasts for 40 days and the devil comes and tempts him and he keeps tempting him and he keeps tempting them by saying, aren't you God's son? Then do this. Aren't you God's son? Then do this. He actually is testing the reality of what God declared at Jesus' baptism. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. I think that's an important moment in Jesus' ministry. And what I want us to see as I build the case for why we should get baptized, what I want us to see here is not so much the baptism of Christ. What I want us to see is this very simple truth that Jesus obeyed God. That, That is what defined the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, was obedience to God. The night before Jesus was crucified, the night before Jesus was arrested, what he did is he was praying in the garden and he said, not my will, but your will be done. He was asking God, God, if there's any way out of this, is there any way for me to not die on a cross? But not my will, your will be done. What you want, I'm here for you. Jesus obeyed God. So I'm not saying we should get baptized because Jesus got baptized. What I want us to understand about Jesus is that when it came to what God wanted for him, he obeyed it. Now the question has to be asked, does God want us? Does God want his people? Does God want his followers to be baptized? Because if God wants us to be baptized and we're going to follow the model of Christ and Jesus obeyed God, then we too, as Christians, should obey what God wants. So, first thing I want to point out from this passage in Matthew 13, I just think it's ironic that when we're talking about the obedience of Christ, he demonstrated his obedience in baptism. I think that's a powerful statement right there. All right, so the next passage that I want to go to is Acts chapter 2. Peter replied, okay, all right. Acts chapter 2 gets me amped up. I know, that's the, the, I'm, I'm throwing my Bible nerd card. Um, when you read Acts chapter two, you should really read Acts chapter one first. I know, that's like, like revolutionary, right? Before you read the second chapter, read the first chapter. But in Acts chapter one, what happens is Jesus has come back from the dead. Now this is significant. We talked about this leading up to Easter. So if if it's your first time, I would really challenge you and encourage you, please go back and listen to the, the last few sermons because all of this is kind of building on itself. Jesus went to the cross for me and for you. Jesus died on a cross in our place so that we don't have to incur judgment or penalty for our sins before an almighty, perfect, righteous God. Jesus took the penalty for our sins on the cross and he died for it. That's what, when people say Jesus died for you, that's what they mean is that Jesus died so that your sins could be atoned for, could be forgiven, so that my sins could be atoned for and be forgiven. And then after Jesus died, he defeated death. So not even death has victory over us. Jesus came back from the dead in resurrection. He came back as a new person, as something more. And then he promises that same resurrection for us. And in Acts chapter 1, the resurrected Christ is ministering and is talking to all of the people who had been his followers. There was about 120 of them. Can you imagine what that's like? A life lived in service to others. A life laid out on the cross in service to others. And then all you had to show for it was 120 people. The Son of God, 120 people. So Jesus is talking to these 120 people and he says, okay guys, I don't know if he actually said that, but whatever. This is my paraphrase. Okay, guys, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I want you to wait. Wait for the gift that I told you about, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you and dwell within you. You will have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Go back to Jerusalem and wait. So these 120 people, they go back to Jerusalem and they're waiting and they're praying and they're waiting and they're praying and they're waiting and they're praying and And then on a a big national Jewish holiday, the, the holiday of Pentecost, a bunch of Jews from surrounding regions and surrounding lands had all come back to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday and they hear this really loud sound. The sound like a, a loud rushing wind is what the Bible says this big sound and they, they hear it and it's, 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 it's a big deal. And so thousands of people think, what was that? And they, they go to where they heard the sound. And when they get there, 
they see these 120 people well, when, this, when this loud sound like a rushing wind happened and everybody was drawn to what caused that sound, the Holy Spirit had been coming down upon these 120 believers. And these 120 believers, they had the Holy Spirit just pumping and living and, and inside them. And so these, these thousands of people in Jerusalem that were there for Pentecost, they come to where the, the, the 120 believers are and they say, what, what, what's happening? What was that sound? And they see these 120 believers speaking in different languages, languages that come from the different regions that all of these people are from. And all of these 120 believers, they're speaking in different languages. They're, they're telling people about Jesus. They're telling people about the cross and the resurrection. And these, these thousands of people, they don't know what to make of it. In fact, they, some of them even say, these people have to be drunk. How can they just speak in different languages? What's going on? And Peter stands up. And Peter says, we're not drunk. It's nine in the morning. Crazy. We're not drunk. This is what God said would happen. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us because of Jesus. You know who Jesus is, right? A few weeks ago, Jesus was here in Jerusalem. And a lot of you were here for that, for the Passover celebration, another holiday. And a lot of you were here crying and screaming, crucify him. Well, that Jesus that was nailed to the cross, that was the Savior. That was the Messiah. That was the one that God sent to save us. Well, these people, I, I love what happened there's something very true that, that I think some of us need to hear this morning. Remember these 120 believers, they were waiting and praying, waiting and praying, waiting and praying, and then in one day, a mighty move of God happened. Some of us really need a mighty move of God in our lives, and I'm telling you, there is great value in waiting and praying on the Lord. So they're waiting and praying, and then God shows up and they take the opportunity that God gives them and they tell these people about Jesus. And in this moment, the thousands of people that were around, it says in, in Acts chapter two that they were cut to the heart. They were grief stricken because they realized the guy that we called for crucifixion, the guy that we nailed to the cross was our savior. What do we do now? And then... Peter gives him this amazing word of hope and comfort. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we do now? Repent and be baptized. What was the big, grand, overall message that this, this big day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit had put into these, these 120 believers? What, was, what were all of these thousands of people supposed to know? What do we do now? And Peter's response, repent and be baptized. That's what I want us to focus on. Understand from Matthew chapter 3, Jesus obeyed God. Understand from Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. That word repent, it's so simple. All repent means is you're going in one direction. Repent means to stop. Go the other direction. Repent means you think one way about God. Stop. These people were thinking one thing about Jesus, that he was a blasphemer, that he was not the Messiah. And Peter said, repent. Turn the other direction. Accept him and be baptized. Now the baptism part, that's the sticky part. That's the part that a lot of us have a problem with. Because maybe like me, you were sprinkled as a baby. Or maybe you're like, yeah, but I don't think that in order for me to have forgiveness of sins, in order for me to have the gift of the Holy Spirit, I don't think I have to, to, to be submerged in water. And I would agree with you. It's, it's not about being submerged in water. In fact, the Bible actually teaches that. The Bible speaks to that. Now we're going to go to 1 Peter. And we go to 1 Peter chapter 3. There's a lot going in 1 Peter chapter 3. I, I hate skipping over so much, but it's a very loaded chapter. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter references Noah. If you don't know who Noah is, I'm not talking about Noah, one of the daughters of Zelophehad. 
How do you know that one? Because I named my daughter after that girl. There's a girl in the Bible named Noah, and I named my little girl Noah, so I know about that one, right? So I have my, my, my beautiful Noah. I'm talking about Noah, the Noah that a lot of people know about. <laughs> See what I did there? Oh, come on. That was good, y'all. A lot, of the, a lot of people know the story of Noah. It's Noah and the ark, Noah's ark. And if you don't know it, that's okay. That's fine. I'll tell you about it a little bit. The, the, the world had soured. The world had gone bad. And so God wanted to, to, to kind of, hey, there was wrath and there was judgment that needed to occur on the world because of the sins of the world, and, but th- there was still some righteousness left in the world. And so God showed up to Noah and he said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. Bring your wife, bring your sons, bring their wives, bring them onto the ark, and I'm gonna bring all the animals onto the ark and you'll survive the flood if you do what I tell you to do. And so Noah does this and he passes through the flood waters on the ark. And so Peter is referencing that story and he says this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also that's the part that people get hung up on and rightly so see Christian it's cut it's cut and dry the Bible says that baptism saves that we're not going to heaven unless we get dunked in water and there are systems of faith that believe that I have some friends who believe so strongly in this that if they ever tell somebody about Jesus, it could be two in the morning, and that person wants to believe in Jesus, they'll call their pastor and say, we gotta get this, baptized, this guy baptized now. And I remember asking my friend this question one time. I said, so what happens if you get in a car accident on the way to the baptism? I know, we gotta drive real careful. Look what Peter says. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not, see it's very clear, not the removal of dirt from the body. I've got four kids and there is one lesson that I could tell you about parenting. Baths remove dirt from the body. My kids will come in after playing one day and I'm like, you know what, we're gonna hose you down three times before we take you inside. They need to be sprayed. They need to be covered in the water to get all that dirt off of them. Peter's saying, look, it's not about going in water. It's not about washing the outside external off. That's not what saves you. What he says is it's not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Peter's saying is, look, it's, when, when we talk about baptism, we're talking about being baptized into Christ. We're talking about being baptized into the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what saves you. The water, that's just what happens on the outside. But it is still, just like Noah passing through the waters, our water baptism that we practice today is still very important. So John's baptism, when John baptized Jesus, that was a baptism of repentance, of getting ready for the kingdom of God. Now I have this question, I've always had this question, why did Jesus need to do a baptism of repentance? Wasn't he perfect? Wasn't Jesus like, you know, he didn't have any sins. So why would he need to do a baptism of repentance? I think the reason God wanted Jesus to do his baptism with John is because John had been telling everybody, get ready for the kingdom of God. Be prepared. And so when Jesus gets baptized with John, he identifies himself. He unites himself with all of the people who had been preparing for the new kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I'm here with you. Jesus comes to meet us where we are at to lead us into his kingdom. That's why I think Jesus got baptized. And then in Acts chapter two, why, why does Peter say repent and be baptized? Couldn't, didn't they have this superior baptism now? They just went through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had something better than water. Of course they did. Water baptism now doesn't mean a baptism of repentance. Now it means something so much more significant. It means something so much richer. It means a baptism of new life. It means a baptism of resurrection in Jesus Christ. So what I want us to see from this passage is very simple. Faith with water. Not faith in the water, but faith with water. I've got something to kind of help illustrate this. I've got two two pieces of paper. Everybody see this? Okay, this one is from my wife's purse. 
This one is from my children's grocery store that's in our playroom. This one's green. So is this one. This one has a picture of George Washington on it. So does this one. This one has a one and some flourishes and a bunch of other stuff. And so does this one. This one says on it somewhere, it says legal tender. This one says legal tender also. I'm not going to, I'm going to kind of ignore the part where it says this is not legal tender, but it still says it on there, right? This piece of paper has real value. This piece of paper is next to worthless. The analogy that I'm trying to draw is simply this. Being dunked in water is like a worthless piece of paper. It may look the exact same. It may be the same color. It may have the same feel. It may be the same size. It may look the exact same as, say, a believer, a follower of Christ getting baptized. But getting dunked in water is just a piece of paper. This, this piece of paper right here this one has value while this one doesn't because the authority of the United States government gives this its value. The authority of God in heaven by the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what gives water baptism its value. It's faith in Christ that makes water baptism valuable. So is it necessary to go to heaven? Is it necessary to be baptized in water, to have the Holy Spirit, to, to have forgiveness of sins? No, but it is still very, very vitally important because it is given value by God himself. That's why Peter says this in, chapter, in 1 Peter chapter 3. So here's the very simple, simple, simple why. Why should people get baptized? And I know it's not rocket science, it's not real deep theology, and I'm sorry for this, but it's the truth. I think that God wants us to be baptized, and that's why. It's real simple. God wants every Christian to be baptized. Now that word Christian, I was hesitant to use it. I thought maybe I should use follower of Christ or Christ follower or disciple or something. But really all Christian means is little Jesus. Trust me, if anybody in this room knows that, I do. Because I was born a Christian. Come on, man, y'all are dead today. (laughs) Nobody's born a Christian. You have to have faith in Christ. That's what makes you Christian. I was born with the name Christian. And my whole life, my mom, my dad, everybody told me what the word Christian meant. It means follower of Christ. It literally means to be a little Jesus. That's what it means. If we are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, then we should be, like Jesus, obedient to God. And I think the fact that Peter stood up in this great moment and said, repent and be baptized, I think the fact that he preached in 1 Peter chapter 3, that it's not about this outward symbol, it's about what happens in our heart. We are resurrected with Christ. That's what saves us. But it's the outward symbol that demonstrates what has happened in us. That is what baptism is. So it's faith with water. That's what baptism is. And why should we be baptized? Because it's what God wants. I think that's what the Bible teaches. When I was preparing for this message, it was actually yesterday. I've been reading this book. Um, Actually, when I say reading, I do audio books. That's how I do most of my books. But this is a book called The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. It was written in 1957 by this this, this, uh, Chinese guy that um, was incarcerated in China for (laughs) trying to win people to Christ. He was a convert to to Christianity, and he gave his life in service to, to Jesus and wanted to tell people about Jesus, and he ended up ended up going to prison for it. And he wrote this wonderful little book called The Normal Christian Life. And when I was listening to the book yesterday, I was actually on my way to have breakfast with somebody who is getting baptized next week. I'm really excited about it. And I was listening to this, and when I heard this, I said, I have to remember that. And I got back home, and I grabbed the book, and I pulled it up. But listen to this quote, because I don't think Watchman Nee, I don't think I could say it any better than what he says. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward faith. When in my heart I truly believe that I have died, have been buried, and have risen with Christ, then I ask for baptism. Thereby I publicly 
Thereby I declare publicly what I believe privately. Baptism is faith in action. Nailed it. That's what it is. That's why we should do it. Next week, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about putting the baptismal pool in this area. If we ruin a few electronics, I'm okay with that. I'm excited about it because it's not going to be me that's proclaiming faith in Christ. Baptism is faith in action. That's what baptism is. And we should do it. Every Christian should go through what I call, or the scripture, I don't even like calling it believer's baptism because scripture talks about baptism. It just means we go underwater because it's an outward symbol of what's happened in us. I have died with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. We come out of the water because I have risen with Christ. It is an outward symbol of the inward faith. It is faith in action. So next week we are going to loudly proclaim that faith in action. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. So maybe you're you're watching online or, or you're in the room right now and you want to take that step of faith. Maybe like me, you were sprinkled as a baby and you think this is, this is my time to do this for me now because this is my faith in action. Like I started the message with, just fill out that red card and tell me. We'll get in touch with you. I'd love for you to come forward next week. Christian, you're just, you just want to see your baptism numbers go up. Yep, said it last week. I'll say it again. Definitely want to see my baptism numbers go up. You know why? Because Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God wants every Christian to be baptized. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. It's not a ritual or a work that we can do that brings us salvation. If we think that we can go to heaven because we got dunked in water, we're just like that worthless piece of paper over there. It may look like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. What makes baptism real is faith in you. We know that, God. I think your scripture teaches that. I think that's why Jesus said, go make disciples. We have to be followers of Christ. And once we've been able to say, I'm dead with Christ, I've been buried with Christ, and I am risen with Christ, then we're ready to be baptized. Then we're ready to publicly declare what has happened privately in us. So God, if there's a person in this room that's not buried with Christ, that hasn't experienced that new life in Christ. If there's a person watching online right now, they're watching on their phone or they're watching from their living room and they've never experienced this new life in Christ, then God, I'm praying right now could be their moment that you could call them so clearly and so loudly that they have to respond by calling on you, by praising you for what you've done. If that's you and you're sitting in this room or you're watching online right now and you want to accept Jesus, You want to die with Christ so you can be raised with Christ. I can give you a prayer of faith to say, but it's really, it's it's your faith that matters. If you want to pray with me right now, just pray this prayer with me. God, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, with whom you are well pleased to die on the cross for me. Thank you for victory over death in the resurrection of Christ. Please come, Lord, into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I praise you for the cross, and I praise you for the resurrection. Father, for those of us in this room that maybe have never been baptized, Maybe they've struggled with it or they've wrestled with it or maybe now it's the beginning of a struggle with them. God, I pray that you'll strip away everything that would get in the way. All of our traditions, all of what other people have told us and really, truly, Lord, that this will just be a a time of intimacy between you and them where you very clearly through your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit tell us what you want and help us to be like Christ and obey you even if it means walking 70 miles, even if it means doing something difficult, help us to be obedient to you in all things. And I would pray, Lord, including baptism. God, I pray 
as humbly and as boldly as I can for next week. Lord, I praise you for the 10 people who have come forward to be baptized next week. God, I pray for more so that we can stay faithful to the great commission you've given us. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us, knowing that Jesus is with us to the very end of the age. It is in his great and powerful name that we pray and we ask for something great to happen today, Lord, next week and then on. Use us, Father, to bring about revival in our church in our community, in this nation, in the world, by the power and the spirit of Jesus our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.